With the current shifting retail landscape, have you considered that loyalty begins the moment after purchase? In today's episode, we're joined by Thomas Diaz, co-founder and CEO of Flex Engage, and he explains how to use post-purchase marketing to build trust with your customers and grow your brand. Welcome to Unified Brand Podcast, brought to you by Elements Brand Management, a weekly brand building and brand strategy podcast to help you unlock your brand's potential, stand out from the competition, and create impact. So today we're joined by Thomas Diaz, co-founder and CEO of Flex Engage. He's also an expert in consumer buying habits, post-purchase marketing, and retail trends and innovation. So it's really good to have you on, Thomas, and it would be great to find out a little bit more about Flex Engage and how you got into the retail innovation space. Yeah, awesome. Uh, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So a little bit about Flex Engage. Our company helps marketers and retailers better engage customers post-purchase. And we do this specifically by focusing in on transactional communications. These are often overlooked, ignored communications by retailers. And when I talk about transactional communications, I'm talking about things like receipts uh, when you walk out of the store. I'm talking about your order confirmations when you buy online, curbside communications now with COVID. We help retailers manage all of those and personalize all of those, and then use those as a springboard to launch post-purchase marketing and uh, better brand loyalty after the purchase is being made. That's a little bit about the company and how we got into this. And just uh, very funny, here in the US, there's a chain by the name of CVS. You might have known them, they're a pharmacy company. And one day, a friend of mine walked into a CVS and made a purchase and walked out with a seven foot long receipt. And we thought, <laughs> we thought, hey, well, you know, we were just buying vitamin water and, you know, here we are killing a forest for this yeah. vitamin water that we just purchased, right? And we just started putting our heads together and really said, you know, it's an archaic to really, you know, hand these huge long paper receipts. It's an archaic so that we communicate with a customer after they made a purchase in that way. And that led us to developing the industry's leading digital receipt company. So, you know, currently from a digital receipt perspective, we're almost at, um, we have almost 20,000 stores using our digital receipt technology in the US, Europe, South America, and Canada. And then just broader how we then just kind of made this a bigger platform. We've noticed that receipts weren't part of this only archaic communication. Retailers had this broader plethora of communications, which is called transactional communications that are often overlooked but are very important because consumers are really paying attention to them. So that's why we got into this space. So today we focus on receipt marketing in the store. We help retailers with curbside communication. So how do they help uh, better communicate with the customers once they place a purchase that they want to pick up a curbside or better track their orders over time when they place an order online. So that's what we do today. Well, it sounds really interesting. It sounds cool how you can kind of take that information and use that in a sort of friendly way for the customer, like you said, in a way that doesn't, like you say, kill an entire forest with like a receipt, but also then gets the business that data they need and how they can keep in touch and things like that. I think that's really cool. So how has retail changed over the years? What's the kind of differences you've seen? Yeah, I think that there's probably two or three big differences that I've seen. And, and you know, I don't think that any of these will come as a big shock to your listeners. One is there's this term that's been thrown around about omni-channel. So people don't necessarily just want to walk into a store and buy they're walking to a store or they're going to a website or they're looking at the mobile application or they're looking at social media. So a brand really can engage or can interact with consumers in a bunch of different ways, right? And so what we've seen is uh, retailers have really been trying to figure out how can they talk to those customers wherever that customer is at or interact with those customers however they're coming to the store. It's not only about a brick and mortar store location anymore. It's about really transacting on all different type of platforms. So that's that's one. Second is around um, contactless. And this is probably one that COVID has really you know, thrown off in a big way. People don't want to pay with a credit card. And so contactless payments have taken off, right? Contactless pickup. So people don't want to pick up, you know, like they don't even want to go into the store. They want to be outside the curbside. And one that's very near and dear to our hearts is contactless receipts. So, you know, as people are paying with contactless payments, isn't it kind of ironic that if you pay with an Apple Pay or a Samsung Pay or something like that, but then you get handed this piece of paper from a receipt, <laughs> you know, so, you know, retailers are really looking at contact lists much more. So those are a few things that we're noticing. Cool. Yeah. Sounds interesting. So you sort of mentioned um, post-purchase marketing, sort of a bit of a, more of a definition about that kind of thing. What are some of the things that that includes and how does it fit into the customer journey? Yeah, I think many marketers, I know you have some marketers that are listening on your podcast here. Many marketers are typically focused on acquisition, customer acquisition. And acquisition for retailers, for any kind of marketer, has been the name of the game. And, you know, there's even 
you know, metrics around this. There's the CAC, you know, cost of customer acquisition. There's the funnel, you know, all these kind of things. Uh, and so brands are spending, you know, millions and billions of dollars on trying to acquire customers. But many, I think, marketers have forgotten is that once a customer comes in and makes a purchase with you or engages with you or is part of the family of your brand, your job is now equally, if not more important around how to keep that customer loyal, how to keep them, you know, within the staple of your brands. But many marketers have kind of shied away to that because the easy thing is just to, you know, play with the dials and the knobs around, hey, I need to acquire more customers, I need to acquire more customers. And they spend so much of their budget and attention on customer acquisition and not as much of like post-purchase marketing. So when we talk about post-purchase marketing, it's how do you get a customer to really engage with your brand after a purchase has been made? So you've done an excellent job. You got them into your store. You got them into your brand. Now, how can you keep them? continuing to come back? How can you keep them to continue to be loyal with you? How can you keep them, you know, to, you know, refer your brand? And so that's what we talk about when we say post-purchase marketing. It's any marketing that happens after a purchase is being made. Wow, cool. Yes, that's really good for brand building, keeping that trust and loyalty and keeping those customers happy and making sure that they're just not slipping out the back door kind of thing, I guess. Like you said, you're getting people in through that funnel, but then they're not slipping out the back door and, and keeping those customers engaged. I think that's really cool. And yeah, it's exciting to understand how to do that and how you can do it. Yeah, so how have consumer habits changed? How have they changed with their buying habits and things like that? You know, it's really interesting. And it's almost like, Chris, you know, things are accelerating faster and faster every single day as companies innovate and iterate. But I think the, the biggest habits that have changed from a consumer perspective are around three. Number one, it's all around convenience, right? You know, so forever, I mean, convenience sometimes, sometimes people say, necessity is the mother of invention. But I think, you know, nowadays I would say convenience is the mother of invention. That, consumers yep. are really wanting more and more convenient options. I don't know if it's just we're getting lazier, or we're just getting busier or what it is, but people are really wanting more convenient options. I mean, if you look at it, that's why Amazon has grown quite a bit with their Prime memberships, you know, next day delivery, same day delivery, you know, all this stuff, you know, people are really looking at what are the best convenient ways to shop, to interact. So I think convenience is a huge factor. Along with convenience, a close cousin is around immediacy immediacy. People want things now. People, you know, want that instant gratification. I think we have maybe social media to thank for this one, right? Like hey, how many yep. people are clicking my link, my photos and my, you know, it's the dopamine if you would, right? Yep. So like, I want things now, I want things my way. And, you know, we at least here in the US, we're seeing the delivery companies taking off. So getting same day delivery, you know, the door dashes of the world, the Uber ease of, you know, those companies, because the people want things and they want this fast. And, you know, and like, that's a big thing around curbside right now, curbside communications, which we're working on. People say, hey, I want to be able to have something convenient. So I want to be able to pull up to the store and pick up something at the curbside. But I don't want to wait two hours for it. I want, when I show up to the store, I want you to be meet me outside with a bag in hand, with a smile on your face and hand it to me, right? And so that's what people want to see. So I think convenience and immediacy are really two big things that we're seeing out there. Yeah, definitely. The further you go on through time, kind of, yeah, the more convenient things are the things that sort of drive consumer habits, definitely. I think that's uh, yeah, interesting point. And I was going to say to you that I was talking to somebody uh, yesterday called Chip Edwards, and he, he specializes in those like Alexa and Google Home and things like that, and talking mm -hmm. about those. And he was actually mentioned about to do with Domino's, how he ordered a pizza and was like literally on the way and then picked it up straight away when he got there, that kind of thing. And yeah, so definitely the convenience side of things is really, really crucial these days, I think. Definitely. There's something interesting that's happening kind of along those lines. When you talk about pizza, there's a little bit of visibility that consumers are demanding now with all the technology. So Domino's is a really interesting case study where they launched, where's my pizza tracker? I don't know if you've heard of this or not. No. Have you heard no, of that? No. So here in the States, you can order a pizza through Domino's. And basically Domino's said, we want to go all in on technology. And so when you order a pizza through them, now, all of a sudden, with the app, you can see exactly where your pizza is at in the process. So the pizza's coming out of the oven. The pizza's being prepared. The pizza got into the delivery car. The pizza is five minutes away. The pizza's at your front doorstep. And not like it's the visibility of that. And it's amazing how accurate from a timing these things are. So I think that consumers are going to demand that more and more. We're like, I want visibility into this process. We have another product called Flex Tracker, which is around, hey, where's my package at? Where's my order at at any given point in time when you buy something online? And it's, it's really trying to mimic that, where's my pizza? But it's like, where's my order when I buy something online? So very similar. Yeah, that's really cool. That's the kind of thing that from a brand point of view is sets you apart from the rest of your competition because it sort of builds that brand, it builds that customer experience that sets you apart from the rest. I think that's a really yeah crucial part because once you've done something like that, once you've experienced something like that from a brand, you're not going to go anywhere else because you have, like you said, that minute detail 
and you know where everything's coming from. I think it's, yeah, it's really, really good use. So you said flex tracker. So what other things do you do with Flex Engage? What other sort of features do you have and things that you focus on with regards to that? Yeah, so the way I would look at our company is, is as follows. So we can help retailers with their post-purchase marketing. If somebody buys something in the store, so for the store, or if they buy something on the web or online. For the store perspective, we have this technology called receipt marketing. It's a receipt marketing platform. And so what that means is that when somebody makes a purchase, they can either get a digital receipt that's powered by us, or an electronic receipt, so you don't have to kill a forest, right? Or you could get a paper receipt. But in either of those cases, the receipts themselves will have very targeted, very pinpointed marketing on it based on what you've purchased, based on who you are as a customer, what store you're in, what state, you know, what have you. So say you go to, you know, a vitamin supplement company and you're making a purchase there and we stay, we see that you're buying a vitamin C and, you know, we've seen that you've been in that store in previous times, but you're not a loyalty program. So now on that receipt that you're going to take a look at because you want to make sure at least that you got charged appropriately, right? Yeah. But on that receipt now, you're going to say, hey, Chris, we noticed that you're not a loyalty member. Join now and get $10 off your next purchase, right? And then as you scroll through that receipt, then at the bottom it's like, hey, thanks for buying that vitamin C. Did you know that vitamin D and protein powder go great with that as part of your regimen? And so with that, now with these algorithms, we take something that was this archaic channel, which is a receipt, and we make it into much more of an engaging marketing dialogue, if you would. And you would be surprised, you know, Chris, so many people say like, well, if somebody just makes a purchase, will they be likely to buy with you again? And the answer is absolutely yes because that's when the customer is more psychologically more invested in the brand, they're more engaged with the brand, and they have like a sense of endearment with you as a brand and the products that they've purchased. So that's a little bit around the store side with this receipt marketing platform. On the e-commerce side, as I was mentioning, we can help personalize order updates. So like, hey, there's an order that's been confirmed, the order has been shipped. Those are typically emails that you send out. Typically they're very basic and boring. We do the same thing that where we can personalize those communications. So that's one piece of it, these communications, but then also around a flex tracker. So being able to track as a consumer, where is my product? Hey, my product left the warehouse. My product is on the truck on its way to me. And all along, this is a web page where you can now get also offers, promotions and ads. And then the last component is around really helping retailers with curbside communication. I don't know how big this is over in the UK quite yet, but here in the US, more and more people are saying, hey, I'm gonna place an order online. I wanna pick it up in the store, but I don't wanna go inside the store. I want you to meet me at the curbside and give me my goods. Traditionally, retailers aren't using technology with that. With us, we have a technology component that help the retailer better communicate with the store and the customer communicate with the store. So. What all these have in common is that, again, they're transactional communications, they're post-purchase communications, and these communications then can be used as a springboard to start, you know, kind of that loyalty dialogue. Even though somebody has just made a purchase, you start building your brand, you know, what we call it the moment after purchase. And that is, you, know, you start talking to your customer in a better way, and that helps you brand, build the brand loyalty from there. Yeah, definitely. And it sounds like all those different areas that you do are all geared behind that kind of idea of building that brand, building that trust and loyalty. And I think, there is a stat, I can't, can't remember the exact stat, but when you have a repeat purchase, it's a lot lower threshold for a repeat purchase than it is the initial purchase. And like you said, you have that customer that's there and ready. And a lot of people, like you said, avoid, or no, they don't avoid, they don't utilize the fact of their existing customer base enough as they could do. And they sort of, like you said, they're constantly going trying to find new acquisitions through a funnel, but they're not nurturing that existing customer base. And they're the ones that are going to drive the referrals, they're the ones that are going to drive the word of mouth and that kind of thing to kind of pass it on. So yeah, I definitely think that those tools, they sound they sound geared towards that. I think it's a really important part of, of building a brand and people do avoid it or don't use it enough as they can. So there was, there was a phrase on your website that really sort of jumped out to me and that was loyalty begins the moment after purchase. I think that's kind of what we were talking about a little bit there, but this has some synergy with the sort of brand building. I was wondering from your point of view, with a marketing effort, you sort of touched on individual marketing on the receipts, but how does post-purchase marketing, how does that individual side of things with the algorithm, how does that all come together? Because that sounds really interesting. Yeah. So, you know, I think that this is a very important phrase, right? Loyalty begins the moment after purchase. You know, I want to let that sink in to your listeners for a moment. Loyalty begins the moment after purchase. And so what that means is famous scholars and marketers have studied this phenomenon for quite a bit. And there's a few things, right? It's what makes for a loyal customer, right? So a loyal customer, first off and foremost, has to, you as a, as a retailer or as a service provider, 
have to pro provide an adequate good or service that that customer is looking for, right? So you have to satisfy that need or that want that from like, hey, I, there's this good or service. So one is you have to provide a compelling product. Second is, you know, while they're looking for that product or while they're looking to make that purchase, you have to give them a good experience, right? At least an acceptable experience of like that meets their expectation. But then after that, the third component is how does that customer get treated after the purchase is being made, right? After the purchase has been made, all those three components are really what makes up loyalty from a brand, okay? Previously, 70s, 80s, 90s, marketers really studied, there was a term called RFM. It's recency, frequency, and monetization. So what that means is your most loyal customers are the ones that most recently purchased with you, that most frequently purchased with you, and that spend the most money with you monetary, right? And so we really honed in and like, huh, marketers today are really missing out on this recency piece, which means you're not talking to customers the moment after they've made a purchase. Like the moment after they make a purchase is like psychologically the best time you have to hook them, you know, if, you know, if I'm using a fishing methodology there. And so what we really talk about there is somebody just made a purchase. You're delighted. You were able to get through points one and points two. Okay. So now how are you going to talk to them? Right. You know, they just made you were good at getting them to buy with you. But how will you interact with them? Will you interact with them as a person? Will you interact with them as somebody that's important? Will you interact with them as somebody that knows them that they just made a purchase with them? And so that's where we feel like that moment after the purchase. And there's not a more recent moment or a more important moment, like where you are giving them like a receipt or you are giving them a communication about when they've made a purchase. So that's what we think. That's what we say. That moment is so crucial and that it can be that springboard to launching brand building, loyalty, harnessing. And if you're just giving them a basic receipt or if you're just giving them a basic curbside communication order messaging, you've missed a humongous opportunity to engage and talk with those customers. Definitely. I think that sort of that moment, like you said, straight afterwards is crucial. And I think the barrier for repeat purchase, and like you said, if, if it's individual and it's tailored to them and it has those particular things, it almost has that feeling as a consumer that you've been noticed and you kind of, the brand understands you. There's a slightly yeah. more of a, a connection there because they've, they've almost taken the time, even though it's the algorithm, but it's taken the time to give you something that is dedicated to you. And you see it with Amazon, don't you? Straight after purchase, other customers have bought this, this, and this. And you're in that moment of ready to maybe purchase again, I think, and, and just sort of take up that mantle and yeah, continue that purchasing okay. journey. Yeah, and I think we can all appreciate what I'm saying because we're all consumers. No matter yeah. who you are yeah. in this planet, we're all consumers. And just as you said, as a consumer, myself or yourself or any of your listeners, you know, after you make a purchase, don't you want to be recognized? Like, hey, Chris, thank you for that purchase. As a sign of loyalty, you know, X, or thank you, you know, we'd like to see you come back and people that buy what you just bought also like these kind of things. Or better yet, hey, because you bought this, here's an instructional video of how to put this together. Or here's yeah. a warranty that goes well with that. I mean, there's so many different ways that this can go along that I think we can all appreciate that. Like, talk to me as a person, as a human, that, you know, recognize me, see me, acknowledge me. And I think that's what people are saying nowadays. Definitely. And I think it's definitely going that way with everything that we do. It's, it's more personalized. It's more tailored to individual experiences and it's about creating those experiences and they're the things that you remember the most is those experiences that are created for you by brands are the things that you remember about the brands themselves and how they made you feel i think is a really big thing that people sometimes forget is how a brand can make you feel is crucial in that the way you build it up in your mind and how you remember them i mean that's the brand marketing side of things is all about that how that brand makes you feel and can take you on that journey so i think it's yeah it's a really good part of that brand building process so you wrote a great article on Flex Engage, which was about the four things consumers want, what retailers can do to deliver them. I wonder if you could touch on this as a way to help the businesses that are listening. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, whether you're just starting out, whether you're a business that's been going on for a while and is looking to continue growing, we believe that there's sort of four things that really consumers are demanding nowadays. And I talked about the high level behavioral changes, but you know, now I'm going to talk about some more tactical things that we're seeing in the street. So first is, you know, you touched on it in a previous point. It's around personalization. I've also been talking about it. It's this word that sort of gets thrown around a little bit, but it's basically, again, hey, talk to me. You have so much information. You can use leverage technology so much out there. You know what I'm buying. Don't just talk to me as a number or don't just talk to me like you talk to everybody else. Talk to me as a human. Personalize my experience, whether it's when I shop on your website or whether I'm coming in the store or whether, you know, I'm just coming, coming for a repeat purchase. 
acknowledge who I am and you know what you know about use the things that you know about me to personalize that experience or that interaction I'm having with you again it could be with interactions over emails that you're sending me it could be calls that you make so you know all of these things consumers want just a more personalized experience consumers say that they will reward those brands that provide a little bit more personalization so I think that you see this across the world where you know retailers and brands are making more of a bet on that so that's point one and point two is around, you know, being intentional with the technologies that you're looking at. You know, right now, I think uh, one of the biggest things we get told by the brands we work with is just there's so much technology that you can deploy and have out there. And, you know, it's actually a little overwhelming and I can sympathize with that because even myself, I get over inundated with technology offers. And so what we say is, you know, by being intentional with technology is look at the technologies that are really going to solve desires from a convenience perspective, from the immediacy perspective, what's going to make that consumer experience better? So, you know, a good example of this is the order track. So, you know, being able to provide your consumers better visibility of where your order is when they've purchased online, right? Or being able to have a more convenient curbside experience. So those are all technologies that are very intentional, they're purpose-driven. So we say looking at that, and very similar to that, you know, it's not only about intentional technologies, but also can you provide seamless technologies? So contactless is a big example here, right? You know, where people want a seamless experience. Hey, I just want to take off my phone and pay with Apple Pay. That's seamless, right? Similar to that, why couldn't you do a, a digital receipt? Hey, I'm paying with my Apple Pay. I want to do a digital receipt associated with that. Don't give me that piece of paper. So I think that's the third thing. And the fourth thing that, you know, people get surprised by, I think, you know, retailers should sort of temper expectations around social. You know, I think retailers and brands, you know, many times get frustrated with, like, I don't see the returns on social. What well, people aren't buying from my social channels. And they have to remember that many times consumers don't want to buy from social. They get inspiration from social technologies or social media. They look and browse, but they're not necessarily looking to transact from there. It's just another touch point. It's something that retailers should, should use to continue that brand building, that brand awareness, but they should sort of temper that. That may not be the channel that your, all your sales come from, but it's yet it's a, an important and relevant channel to sort of continue that dialogue with the customer along their purchase cycle. Yeah, definitely. I think you see that a lot when people go into social, they get inspired and then they go straight to a search engine later on and they search for that particular brand or they search from straight away, but they kind of, there's not always, like you said, a straight to conversion from the social media. It's more of like the brand awareness side of things and building that brand in their mind that helps them to take the next step. So I think that's definitely something that you see a lot more of. What brands do you see implementing post-purchase marketing and consumer engagement well? Could be a case study of something you've done yourself. Yeah, I referenced something like this earlier in the podcast, but there's two companies that, you know, we're actually working with and they're doing a pretty good job. These are vitamin supplement companies here in the states gnc and vitamin shop and they're they're both our customers and they're doing a really nice job with this but essentially what they're doing is they've all taken a look at these post-purchase communications and are saying okay how do we take a more holistic view and how do we talk to the customers differently if they're buying online or in the website like some examples our friends at vitamin shop what they're doing when you make a purchase it's purchasing you get a digital receipt as an example on that they start tracking and talking to you like Hey, Chris, thanks for you know spending $50 with that. Did you know you're 10 points away from earning a reward and being able to like sort of like nudge you a bit like, wow, I'm only 10 points away. And that reward that I'm going to get $15 off my next purchase. And so they kind of are keeping this loyalty top of mind that they're thanking you, but they're also kind of encouraging, almost gamifying this experience yeah. a bit to say, hey, you're this much away from your next reward. And we all want rewards. We all want gifts, right? So I think that that's a really interesting one. And our friends from GNC, what they're doing is like they've rolled out some pretty cool technology on the receipt side where you get a paper receipt. And then based on that, they're going to tell you bottom of these paper receipts, like, hey, you're not a gold member yet with us. Come back and shop with us and you get 5% off and 10% off. So again, taking very subtle tactics, if you would, uh, on different technologies, but using those to continue engaging those customers after a purchase is being made. Yeah, definitely. I do like the thing of gamifying. I think gamifying is a really interesting concept and thing to use as part of brand building and marketing in general. That, that idea of reward scheme, loyalty schemes, but also the game of gamification is a really good tool to use. So from that point of view, with the gamifying side of things, what do you see as being the biggest drivers in post-purchase marketing for consumers? Like what are the things that they tend to engage with the most? What are the things that you've seen sort of real successes with on that, on that front? Yeah, I think there's three areas we really see people engaging with quite often. 
One is a loyalty program. So, hey, you know, promoting if you have a loyalty program or not, or promoting how close you are to the next tier or those type of things. So I think some sort of loyalty rewards, points, you know, all of that people seem to react really well. I think it's just natural. We're all creatures that want to have good rewards and want to be told that what level we're in and, you know, aspire to be in another level. So, right. I think that's a good one. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Okay, I think, okay. yeah, that, that, I, I definitely, I just, you're always looking for that kind of, yeah, that next level type thing, aren't you? And yeah, achieving that. And then the other thing I, we see people really engaging with quite often is surveys on the receipt and like uh, reviews and recommendations. So what I mean by surveys so on, on our communication, sometimes we have a thumbs up, thumbs down, or a happy face or our frowny face. Like, how did we do in this shopping experience? And it's as simple as a happy face or a frowny face. And you would not believe that's one of the things that people click on the most where it's like, oh, you know, it was a happy experience. It was a sad experience. And then that will launch a survey of like, well, okay, tell us a little bit more about that. But it's just a natural, you know, I think, again, human tendency, like, am I happy or am I sad? Am I happy or am I sad? Was this good or bad? You know, and it's very simple when you can almost gamifying it. You know, it's almost like the Facebook thumbs up, thumbs down, right? The like, yeah. or not, or the, you know, like, yeah, I like that. I like that. And so, you know, we're getting sort of accustomed to that. And so people are engaging quite a bit with that. And then similar on these transactional communications, we prompt some people that they can leave uh, or they can review a product that they've just purchased. So, hey, how was this? It was a five star product, it was a four and a half. And they kind of give us one. So again, all of these things are sort of gamification type of tools, but that are fueling engagement with retailers. And then also helping build word of mouth, build referrals, and then, you know, kind of build up just a deeper connection with that retailer. That's really interesting because reviews are key at the moment. And with all the different kind of platforms where you can check out a brand and see the reviews they have and kind of people making decisions based on those reviews, it's really good to find a way to get more reviews and to get more reviews at that point as well. Because one of the things that you find sometimes with getting reviews is you end up following up something weeks down the line. And when you follow up something weeks down the line, you've kind of, you've missed that point of jubilation and like the point where they're really happy. And I think to be able to do that straight away is a really good tool to build those reviews and those those sort of quality customer testimonial. Yep, absolutely. And I like the happy face, sad face thing. And I think that's something that I've I've, I've maybe engaged with myself. And I've seen, I've seen some studies that show that actually surveys and things like that, allowing people to give their view is something that they're really happy to engage with. And it's something that it's really good for businesses and brands to see that and get any feedback they can especially the negative stuff is sometimes the gold, isn't it? It's the stuff that yeah. will tell you where you have those sticking points in your customer service or we have the sticking points in your way that you do things. I think getting that sort of data for companies is crucial today, I think, to streamline that operation. Think about this experience. If you know you made a purchase on, let's just use a receipt, and on the receipt, you give feedback that it was, you made the purchase, but you had a bad experience while making the purchase, right? And then you, know, you fill out some details about why it was a bad experience. Think about how powerful it would be if a brand reaches back out to you and says, hey, we noticed that you had a bad experience. Yeah. Thank you for making that purchase despite having that bad experience. How can we make this right? Or, or we heard you and here's what we're doing about it, you know, going forward. Like, how powerful is that? There's nothing that builds branding or, you know, loyalty better than somebody says, I see you, I hear you, and here's what I'm doing about that. So, I mean, it's really powerful. That's really good. Yeah, I mean, the, one of the things we say to our clients is if you get any negative feedback is to do that, to reach out and to kind of engage it because people are so scared of getting that negative feedback, whether it's on social media and different platforms, but actually you can turn that into something that is you're helping somebody, you're helping them to get where they want to go. You reach out to them, like you said, you're talking to them on a personal level and it really creates this thing, especially sometimes you see it with, I think Wendy's did it really well. As a testimonial, they did it on their Twitter account and they sort of reached out to a, a disgruntled customer and turned it around. And I think it really did elevate that brand with everyone that saw that interaction going on. So I think that's really, yeah, a really powerful thing to be able to do. Where can people find out more about sort of Flex Engage? And is there anything that you'd like to sort of tell us about some of the things you've got plans coming up and things like that in the future? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, it's pretty easy. People can go visit our website, flexengage.com. That's uh, flex, like flexible, engage, like engagement. So flexengage.com. You can find out more there. If you want to reach out to somebody directly, you can email hello at flexengage.com. Hello, like you're waving at somebody. <laughs> hello at flexengage.com. And so people can go there. And we like to say to brands or to retailers, we can do a free audit of like, let us check out what you're doing from a post-purchase marketing today. We'll give you this free audit and see how you're doing. You know, you don't have to buy anything from us. You just get a, you know, some free consulting services there. 
But if people are interested in some of the things that we're doing, at the moment, we're giving some free pilots on some of our products. So whether it's uh, three to six months, it's uh, some extended pilots, just so that people can, you know, now during the holidays, test out some new technologies, even post holidays, you know, get a feel for some of the things that we're working on. So feel free to reach out to us. And, and again, a very low salesy type of environment. We'll just look to see how we can help. And mention this podcast and we'll take even better care of you. Let's put us to the test and see how good we do with post-purchase engagement on our, yeah. on our side. Cool. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah, that's really good. And yeah, I'll put all the details and the links in the show notes so people can click on it there. It's been really good having you on. It's been a really interesting conversation, really sort of interesting to find out about post-purchase marketing and Flex Engage. And definitely check out flexengage.com if you have any sort of ideas or things that you want to check with regards to that. Yeah, great having you on, Thomas. And hopefully we can do it again. Pleasure, man. Anytime. Cool. We just put together a weekly brand tip video series, which is designed to help you to unlock your brand's potential and stand out from the competition. And if you're interested, if you just go to Elements Brand Management, all one word, .co.uk forward slash weekly hyphen brand hyphen tips sign up and you'll be delivered a three to five minute video a week straight to your inbox i'll put a link in the show notes if you're interested if you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to receive more you can subscribe in all the usual places we're talking itunes spotify stitcher please if you get a chance rate and review it helps the podcast to kind of get a bit more visibility and allows us to keep on producing these podcasts have a great week catch up soon keep those brands unified